Um, so first of all, thank you so much um, for, for inviting me. I'm very humbled and, and it is um, always easy for me to give back because so many have given to me. So I really appreciate the opportunity and um, look forward to spending some time with you all. And then just want to, you know, you had an uh, inside um, advantage with Bill Fagan on your staff and um, you might have got an answer quicker if you had a bill call. <laughs> uh, you know, just really happy that, that we were able to connect. So um, as we go through, you can click a couple. I don't think I have control of the screen. So I think you'll have to click forward for me. Sure, gladly. So if you want to go a, a couple of, yep, there we go. So uh, we'll start with, with the journey. And I think it's always good to, to just kind of, you know, where did, where did Lisa come from? How did this journey begin? And I always uh, include this picture of, you know, one day year old uh, Lisa Campos uh, to today. And whoever says babies are cute and beautiful, like I guess it's in the eye of the beholder because <laughs> <laughs> clearly you can see that some babies just are not the Gerber baby. <laughs> um, but really uh, just a little bit of background about myself, you know, and again, Hispanic Heritage Month is very um, near and dear to me. I grew up in a in a small town of, of 3,500, one stoplight, one Dairy Queen. Uh, I, I laugh, you know, 48 were in my graduating class and 10 were foreign exchange students who thought that all of Colorado was the beautiful Colorado, didn't realize there was the uh, tornado alley part of Colorado, but was born and raised um, by uh, two incredible human beings, um, both uh, Mexican-American. Actually, my mom um, grew up in Mexico. She um, only achieved a, a second grade education before she was asked to work the fields, um, so didn't um, get that formal education. Um, and then my dad um, of Hispanic origin as well was um, raised in Colorado and was drafted um, after high school to, to fight in the Vietnam War and, and unfortunately did not take advantage of the GI Bill. So um, neither one had a, a formal education, never went to higher ed, um, but was I was really fortunate that they really raised um, two, uh, two daughters who um, understood the value of education and how it could change the trajectory of, of one's life. You know, I grew up a very blue collar. I, I think it, it, it's always fascinating that you, um, uh, there's always this assumption about, okay, you know, sitting athletic director and, and where did you really come from? I am a product of a blue collar family. And I think that that really helped who I am today and the characteristics that I have and um, and how I got to where I am today. But, you know, really I, I grew up in a, in a very blue collar, um, uh, community, a blue collar family. My um, mother worked, you know, as a waitress, as a janitor at a pickle plant. My dad worked at a VA, at a VA administration hospital. I'm a product of sitting in line for government cheese, government peanut butter, um, and a lot of lessons learned through there. I, I often um, think about my son who was growing up in a life of privilege, um, one generation away from how I grew up. And how do I give him some of those experiences to, to add adversity to his life, right? That he really has a, an incredible life um, and, and it's just one generation away um, because of higher education. And that's why I um, just really believe in higher ed. I laugh that our family vacations were, you know, driving in a, um, I don't even know, 1970s Mustang. I mean, it was like not a model Mustang, but this small Mustang. And we would drive it from Colorado to, to Juarez, Mexico to, to visit um, family. You know, we would we would eat ham sandwiches on the way with our, our Coca-Colas. And, um, and I think about, you know, now my son gets to fly in a charter plane with football. And um, so a very different life experience. But that, um, just a little bit about my background. And if you want to flip to the next slide, so what does that mean? Again, against all odds, right? And this has always been my motto is that anything is possible, that you you got to believe in yourself. And um, it, despite those back, the, that background, um, despite all the statistics that say I should not um, be a, should not have gotten an undergraduate degree, let alone a doctorate degree, you know, in this country, less than 6% of Latinos have a doctorate degree against all odds, again, they're out of, you know, 130 FBS um, athletic programs, there's 
um, less than 10% of female athletic directors. So it, it was always this, you know, you're not supposed to do the things that you're, you're doing. Um, but again, because of all the things I'm going to talk to you about, was able to really achieve where I am um, today. So next slide. So it really starts with my personal mission. And when I think about, again, as you can imagine, again, um, I had incredible individuals growing up, despite the naysayers, again, a, a little bit more, you know, the Hispanic culture. I, again, grew up in a really small town and ended up leaving home to attend Colorado State University. And Colorado State was ahead of their time in serving first generation college students. Um, but I was really, you know, I, I say the devil child for leaving home, you know, our, our, particularly the women in uh, Hispanic families aren't supposed to leave home, we're not supposed to leave to go to college. And, and I had a lot of folks in my community um, giving my parents a hard time, giving me a hard time and trying to figure out why would you ever leave home? This isn't what you're supposed to do. How are your parents going to afford this? You're really going to put a strain on them. But when I got to, to CSU, I was immediately surrounded by support. And like I said, they were ahead of their time in how they made sure that kids like me who had never been on a college campus with the exception of maybe a, a basketball camp or something, um, how we could survive and thrive and get through college. And because of that experience and those people who poured into me and those folks who helped bring me along. This is really my my personal mission at the end of the day that I really want to help students, particularly students who look like me, um, provide them incredible opportunities in higher education, make sure they're having an exceptional experience and really helping them earn their degrees so that it will change the trajectory of their life. So this is what I wake up really excited to do every day. Um, this is my my why um, and why I stay in, in intercollegiate athletics and in, in higher higher education specifically. Next slide. So this is my family back in the 70s. I don't, my mom actually doesn't know I share this picture. She may not enjoy that I share a picture of her beehive hairdo, but this is the 70s. And um, my family's really who helped me develop who I was and what my core values were. And if you go to the next slide. So really, um, I'm so thankful that I, I had gone through an exercise about really defining what am I about and what are my core values and how do I show up every day with that? And as you can imagine, education um, it is one of those core values that I believe um, wholeheartedly in lifelong learning. I believe in higher education. I believe in the opportunity, uh, particularly for, for kids who look like me to have access to education integrity this is one that um, it's not about doing the right thing but integrity to me is about doing what you say you're going to do that people can count on you that you're reliable and you do what you say you're going to do having courage there's no way that i would be sitting here in this um, seat or continue sitting in this seat without courage and the courage started again um, to break that trend in, in my family to go to higher education to leave the family, to leave the hometown I was in, to try something different. And then really from there, to leave the state of Colorado, to start my career and to live, you know, a, a lot of different places um, throughout my career to have that courage, despite what the rest of the family thought I should be doing. Um, I'm very loyal, very loyal to the folks I serve, to the staff I have, to the universities, and then of course, family, um, really fortunate um to have been raised by by two great individuals and then throughout my life um met my lifetime partner um darren and we have one son who's now eight years old and um so family is very very important next slide so personal characteristics i share this picture because again i was really uh what I, it might have been what my parents didn't know what they didn't know um so they really let me be who i am and this is me on easter and despite my mom you know despite my mom trying to put me in a pink or you know whatever easter outfit i said no i want to wear my red christmas dress and she said miha people are going to laugh at you collecting or gathering eggs in a christmas dress and i said i don't care and you know what she let me be who i wanted to be from the start so i always share that picture i'm glad that i don't have very many pictures of me as a kid uh, but I'm glad I have that one and it, and it just shows um, 
my characteristics and my personality. So next um, slide. So persistent. Um, you can ask my parents again, very persistent, that we don't get things done unless we are persistent. I'm optimistic. I'm always looking at, at what we can do, not what we can do. Um, really what's important to me is setting goals and we cannot accomplish what we're going to do without goal setting. Um, I was really excited last night. I, you know, the, for those who may have kids, I'm, I'm reading with my son, the, um, seven habits of effective, um, well, it's seven habits for a happy kid or something, but it's Stephen Covey and, and we were on chapter two and it was about having goals. And, and right away, my son was like, let me get my notebook and let me put my three goals. And so I'm glad he's learning at a young age that setting goals is, is very important. Having a plan, knowing what the end is, um, having the end in mind, again, a Stephen Covey um, a philosophy. And then finding solutions. You can ask any of my staff that if they're gonna come in here, um, I, I love our, our our football coach always says, bring the solutions, not the pollution. Um, and my staff knows when you come in here, if you have a list, list of 10 things that are going wrong, you better have a list of 30 of how we're gonna solve it and and, and find those solutions. So these are just personal characteristics, again, that, that I have just always been me. My parents helped me, um, empowered me to have these um things in mind and and um these characteristics and and this is what has helped contribute to to the success that i've been fortunate to have and lisa having these written down the way you have them in this presentation or if somebody is simply writing them down in their notepad it has to help because you have that visual reminder this is who i want to be this is what i want to accomplish what would you advise anyone that's newer in their career when it comes to getting started, becoming what they want to become? Yeah, you know what? Again, to me, it goes back to Stephen Covey, right? Having the end in mind, but always also being flexible and pivoting. What I didn't mention in my story was that I actually did not start in intercollegiate athletics. Um, my career path was in student affairs. Again, because of the great support I received at Colorado State University, um, I got into our, a master's program, um, student affairs and higher education. I dealt with campus discipline, student activities, and my first job out of college was as an assistant dean of students. I was very young, dealing with campus discipline. I saw the underbelly of the, of the institution. And after a couple of years of that, I had an incredible opportunity um, to move into athletics, into the dark side of campus, as my student affairs colleagues um, were, were teasing me about. And why did that happen? Well, because I had created so many relationships across campus. I didn't have the end, it, the, the end in mind was not being in athletics. The end in mind for me was being a vice president for student affairs. But when I was presented it, this incredible opportunity to shift into athletics, and again, the athletic director who hired me knew I was, I, I had a hard work ethic, that I had relationships all over campus, that the things I were do, I was doing were so transferable to athletics. He knew I would learn the athletic side of the house. And it was, I talked to a lot of my mentors and said, what if I don't like it in athletics? And, and we talked through a lot of that. And so I pivoted, I took a chance. It goes back to being courageous. I said, you know what? I'm gonna leave the student affairs dream. I, I can't pass up this opportunity and let's see where it takes me. But I pivoted, you know, that that wasn't what I thought I was gonna be doing. And I just love doing it love serving students, love serving student athletes. It was still in my realm of higher education. So long answer to your question, but it is, um, you know, when, when you're looking at those, being being flexible, knowing what you're wanting to do, um, and just surrounding yourself by great people who recognize the great work that you're doing. Perfect. You could go to the next slide. So kind of uh, what we were just talking about, so the network, right? Your network is so critical. And these are not, you know, when we talk about mentorship and network, it's not just meeting someone for the first time and then sending them something saying, hey, can you can you be my reference? It is meaningful, authentic relationships built over years. Every one of these people I have on here, I've known for at least 15 to 20 some years. It is built relationships. and. I'll share that the uh, individual Mark in the uh, lower right hand corner, I served as Mark Denke's graduate assistant when I was in co at Colorado State. Fast forward, when I was interviewing for the Northern Athletic um, University AD job, Mark was now 
in the board of regents at the Arizona system. Mm -hmm. And we had stayed connected the whole time. So it's no coincidence that I was recruited there. He knew a lot of the individuals, he helped me. But all of these folks um, in one way or the another have shaped my athletic career in particular, um, Mark more so my student affairs career. But my point in this slide is that I have been so blessed and I could fill this up with others throughout my, my career, but these folks were sort of in the right at the foundation of, of my career and I couldn't do it without them. That I have learned so much from each of these individuals. I still stay in contact with them. Um, we They are just great friends and you have to surround yourself by great people, um, the best of the best, learn from them and create those authentic relationships. A couple of years ago or so, we had uh, Michael Kelly, the outstanding athletic director at USF, speak to these fire staff. And I remember him saying, life is a contact sport. And I, I, I'll never forget that quote. And here we are again, proving it, Lisa, and your, your story about Mark. You know, who we work with today can have a huge impact on decisions that we make, whether they, they are advising us or can help open a door in the future. So this is a great lesson for all of us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So just uh, again, the, the, the end of the journey from, you know, a stubborn kid in a Christmas dress to being mm -hmm. named the athletic director at, at NAU um, to, to now being here at UTSA. So we can go to the next slide. So what I know now, you know, lots of lessons throughout the throughout the years. If you want to go to the next slide, um, servant leadership does work. Mm -hmm. You know, this was something I did not understand when I was younger. I think I tried leading it and think about this. You know, I was uh, 24, 25 years old when I became an assistant athletic or, or excuse me, an assistant dean of students dealing with big major issues on a college campus. I did not know how to lead at that time. And thank goodness, I, again, for, for the folks in that slide before, how they mentored and helped me learn about leadership. And now, you know, 20 some years later, I know servant leadership works. And it is you all, I, I'm speaking to the choir here, you know that it is service to the team. It is being there for the team before being there for me. It is having empathy. And I'll tell you that this is one that I could, having a son, having a child has helped with the empathy. That's not how I'm programmed, um, but have learned over the years, the criticalness of having empathy um, in all that we do. Being curious. I come from a place and you can ask my coaches, it's not a place of questioning their calls. It's not a question, a, a, a thing of, of questioning them. It is, I am really curious come to a place with our staff of just really wanting to understand, being self-aware, you know, and these are things that they don't, you have to work on these things, right? That I've worked with executive coaches, I've had 360 evaluations done, and we know that the most growth comes when you're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And when you do a 360 and you put yourself out there for the rest of the staff and you're maybe, you know, a little bit anxious when it's gonna come back, because you know, there's areas to improve and there's areas that you can get better. So being self-aware through intentional activities, leading with the heart and just motivating, um, particularly after COVID, I think, and, and the things that we've, we've experienced, motivating it is really, um, is really working for us in, in, in this servant leadership uh, model. Lisa, as you speak of being curious and, and, and really kind of exposing yourself, be vulnerable from honest feedback from others. I, again, I'm thinking about many in our audience right now that are in the first or second inning of their careers, to use a baseball analogy. What advice would you give them when it comes to accepting, uh, I don't say criticism, but coaching? You know, how, how do we not become so defensive when we hear we're not doing something as well as we could be? Yeah, I'm going to go back to the you don't grow when you don't have that that um, person who's telling you where you need to grow. Mm -hmm. And when we're closed off to it and and uh, we're not listening and we all do it right. 20 years ago, I probably didn't want to hear the feedback and it took some maturity to to hear the feedback. And, and then when you take that feedback and you see how it's working in practice, that you're more receptive to, OK, give me more feedback. and. Um, that is, it's 
as I talked about, being uncomfortable is when the growth happens. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more uncomfortable than hearing where you need to improve, right? But you're not going to improve if you're not um, open to that. And then I would say empowering, you know, hopefully you're working in an environment where others are empowered and you have those relationships to give each other feedback. I don't want the staff reports to me that, that the only feedback they're getting is from me. Mm. They should be getting feedback and we should have created such a great culture and empowerment amongst their colleagues that, you know what, their colleagues are pulling them aside and saying, listen, we got to get you above the line here because mm -hmm. we, we're seeing you struggle in these areas. And ha that's really critical as well, I believe. So the biggest challenge is for someone to admit that they need help and go get it because sometimes we say to ourselves, but that means I'm failing when we don't realize we're gonna fail a lot more if we don't get that assistance. So thank you. Absolutely. This, this is wonderful. And then we all know, you know, when we are servant leaders, when we create great cultures, this is what a winning team looks like, right? Mm -hmm. That again, it is team first. That when you look around our staff, it's a lot of pointing, um, being happy for your team. That it is not about about me but it's about being happy for your team you see an inspired team you see inspired individuals who are dreaming big and who want to do great things you see individuals who are competent and risk takers that we've created an environment um, through the servant leadership that they are willing to take calculated risks they're confident and they and that's the only way we get better you see authentic relationships that i talked about where we can um, talk about, um, have those tough conversations. If, if you all haven't read um, Critical Conversations, it's a book that our staff read before COVID. Um, and it gave us the same language about having critical conversations with each other. Um, high teams that have great servant leadership are high performing and they have a strong culture. We, we were talking about that with Max before you and I started speaking, Lisa, as, as sellers of group events, group outings, what can we do to help them, not just sell them a ticket and not just create a, a great experience, but how can we help that organization generate additional revenue that they need? So it's another great example of that. And I thank you so much. Absolutely. So next slide. Mm -hmm. So just the kind of the, the um, as Boz and I were talking about the, the this audience that I'm speaking to and maybe thinking about what does your career look like and it, is it something um, in intercollegiate athletics and, and maybe aspiring to be an associate athletic director and athletic director. So again, what I know now, you know, you got to know your constituents and you have the ability right now to start knowing your constituents and our constituents, you see the whole list. We have a variety of constituents who all have different needs and wants and expectations. And so I'm not going to uh, read all those, but know your constituents, understand what their needs are, create relationships, collaborate and start knowing them now, um, not when you get in the seat. A great point. Thank you. And then managing your day. Um, everyone wants to be an athletic director. What does that look like, right? Well, the, this is just sort of the, the highlights, but it's different every day, right? That no day looks the same, and, and that's a beautiful thing. But we're constantly hiring, evaluating, developing our staff and coaches, right? That is so critical because our human capital is our biggest strength. So when you don't pour in, when you don't make the right hires, when you don't um, invest and develop, then that's not gonna build great culture. Um, you gotta learn about facilities planning, especially in this day and age, right? There's a ton of, of opportunity in facilities. You gotta know how to fundraise um, and really fundraising is relationships. You gotta learn how to build relationships with your constituents. We always talk about football, particularly women athletic directors who people think we know nothing about football and we have to know about football. Um, that and you know I, I put that up there that you you really if you take care of number one things are going to take care of themselves uh, but there is an expectation that because football is the revenue revenue generator that that you know a little bit about football you got to know about fiscal management you got to deal with that um, particularly in in uh, as we are still getting out of COVID and then crisis management next slide has a few more. 
Um, you got to, you know, focus on your strategic planning. You got to know about federal and state laws. And we know from Title IX to NIL, to, there's, you know, uh, I, sh I have compliance up there from, you know, the, the transfer portal, all of these things that we're hearing about, the different lawsuits. We got to engage the community and we got to make sure our brand and our marketing are out there. So these are just sort of the highlights. It's about managing your day. It's about figuring, hiring great people who can help with all of these. Um, but when you're leading this, you got to be familiar with, with these sorts of things. Lisa, the scope changes with the role that you have, but these are things that whether we have a title of leadership or not, all go into us performing outstandingly. So I, I love what you're saying because it applies to all of us, not only athletic directors. Thank you. Absolutely. And then the last thing I'll just share is, is what who we are and, and what we've been doing. You know, I've been here for, for about five years now. Um, it's hard to believe half that's been in COVID, but our aspirational vision, our why, is really to transform lives as San Antonio's nationally recognized Division One program. That is what we wake up really excited to do every day. And then our our vision, or excuse me, our mission is pretty easy. We're developing students, we're student athletes in the classroom, in competition, in life. We want to be an integral part of our undergraduate experience. We want to enhance the visibility of our university and our community, and we want to engage um, San Antonio and, and beyond. And so this is what um, our Roadrunner game plan is about, what UTSA Athletics is about, and then we do it with excellence, integrity, and unity. So just wanted to share, you know, we, we've had great success over the last few years, um, but it all started five years ago when we put our vision and mission together. That is wonderful. What a story. What a background. What a story. My golly. Lisa, thank you. This, I, I, I found myself as I was doing research preparing for today that my, I felt my moral compass was, was improving just by learning. And, and, and today even solidifies that more. Uh, I, I admire your work in supporting the, the underserved, as I mentioned to you on Friday. First generation collegiate, uh, not just student athletes, but but students, you know, people that want an opportunity to get better. Uh, your work at the collegiate level, board of directors for leadership of women in college. Um, it, it, if, if you were someone in their 20s and, and they're inspired because Hispanic heritage isn't only about celebration, it's educating and inspiring. So regardless of somebody's challenge, we all have challenges, but but some of us less than others. What advice to somebody that may be doubting themselves? What would you say to somebody that thinks that, yeah, but I don't know if I could do that? How do you inspire them? Yeah, first of all, um, again, it, it really is betting on yourself and believing in yourself. And I know that's easier said than done. And I think that, again, just given my my background, that, that I always had a bet on myself, but I cannot overemphasize it did not happen alone. I had so many people who believed in me, but I also sought out those folks that if anyone, whether it was in my undergrad or graduate program or, or as I got into my career, if anyone just showed an inkling of interest in what I was doing, I gravitated to that person and I created a, a, just a great authentic relationship with them. I could not, it, it, again, I just can't overemphasize it is so many people who poured into me, who invested in me to get to help get me where I am today. And I still rely on them. And whether it's those mentors, friends, our staff, um, start that relationship building now and don't be afraid to reach out. You know, again, this our athletics industry is so small. We all know this. And for people like me, um, it, it's so easy to give back. It's so easy to say yes to when um, boss calls to to do something like this. That you know, I save time on my calendar all the time for anyone who just wants to pick my brain. And we have to have pe more people, you know, who continue to give back in that way. And when we have more people in any industry like you that are willing to do that, we just help the next. Uh, the way Denzel Washington put it in a speech once: the next wave. You know, That's the next right. wave coming after me. So That's thank great. you for doing that. Um, you mentioned Bill Fagan earlier, and I didn't know this when I first reached out to you, but with Bill, a 2017 SBJ 40 under 40 recipient. So it's it's not just achieving, it's doing. 
you know, some people forget when they earn that new promotion, when they earn the title, the work is only beginning. How do you stay motivated when it is a world full of challenges and sometimes disappointments? How do you how do you overcome those tough times, Lisa? That's a, a great question. I'm glad that you prefaced it with, um, you know, I, I think people um, sometimes think, oh, when I get in the seat, it's less work. They see a lot of delegation and you know what, it, the work doesn't stop. And I think that a lot of folks don't see all the work that's happening in the background. So right now, when people are entering their career, their work habits mm -hmm. are going to do them, you know, justice when, when they, uh, if they have great work habits, when they get into the seat, right? Because the work never stops. The work changes, but it's still challenging. And it's just a different set of challenges. Um, I would say for me, it is, um, you cannot take, if you have not figured it out, I'm a pretty even keel person, right? I'm not high with the highs and lows with the lows. And, and when you get in the seat, you have to understand you are gonna get a lot of criticism. You're gonna get a lot of praise. Um, and you have to just stay grounded in, in who you are and you know the challenges you're going to have a support system who's going to get you through those you're going to have crises that you're going to get through with with the people who are around you but at the end of the day um, stay off twitter maybe when when <laughs> your football team's not winning um, but really it is staying for me it's staying grounded in who i am and not letting the criticism or the praise um, change you know how i who I am inside and how I conduct uh, my business and in, in the best interest of our students. One of our raise your game training modules for all of our staff, Lisa, is the five personalities of managing. And uh, the point we try to drive home, one of the many points is for any of us to lead others or manage others, we have to start with ourselves. If you can't manage your own emotions, your own work ethic, et cetera, you can't possibly be expected to impact somebody else and get them to do the same thing. I, I think it's wonderful. I, you have been so generous with your time. Uh, do you have time for a question or two? Absolutely. Before? Absolutely. Uh, eager to hear something in the chat. Uh, until then, a, a quick thought. Um, you talked about setting goals. I'll come to a question. Uh, before, before my question, I'll go to Tony Garrett who posted uh, Tony is our uh, vice president of many things, including DEI. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, Lisa. It is impressive and inspiring. I have so many great notes. Question, when thinking about what organizations should do to maximize staff diversity, increase equality and inclusion, uh, what do you feel is important, please? Oh my goodness, this is the, the networking, right? That, that we know if we put in the effort we are going to have a quality candidate pool mm -hmm. and we cannot accept oh we could not find a female representative or we couldn't find a, a person of color we are out there mm -hmm. and who think about who your network is who you reach out to um, and it all starts there right the the it's the mentorship it's the um i always the flip side of that too is I always made my intentions known, right? And I always want young professionals, let us know what your intention, let, do you wanna be an athletic director? Do you want, and help us create that path for you. Because that's gonna be so critical. Um, what This world is small, this athletics world is small. We can help you get to the right folks. And then again, it's a hiring, um, from a hiring perspective and i and that's how i heard the question maybe i didn't hear it correctly but mm -hmm. it is it's going to start with the network getting out there with different organizations because we are there is a diverse candidate pool out there you know uh, bernie mullen our our founder our chairman likes to say a leaders hire other a's a's hire a's and when I was at Arizona State years ago, Lisa Love, the athletic director there at the time, said, I only want to hire people that want my job. So no one should be threatened if someone that reports to them says, I, I would like your job one day because that's an opportunity to help them grow. Wonderful. A uh, question from Chad Cardinal. Uh, you know, how can we as an industry be better uh, to and for working parents, particularly mothers. I hope I, hopefully I read that correctly. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know what? I think COVID has changed this for many mm -hmm. of us um, mm -hmm. that we didn't see a world um, where folks could work from home and, and be productive in that. Uh, and I think being an example, you know, when when I was um, at NAU and, and I had my son, I had a donor who pulled me over and said, you know what, Lisa, you have a tremendous opportunity to set an example of what a woman leader with a child can be. And I'll never forget that. And so folks know here that um, life happens. And sometimes we, we have a kid sitting um, in an office because, you know, they couldn't get to school or whatever might have happened. And um, so I will never have forgotten that, that I have an incredible opportunity to set an example of what being a mother and a leader and a woman is in the athletics um, world. And we take advantage of that and we make everything very family oriented in, in the department. Um, and, you know, people know, you know, things come up. And, and again, like I said, with COVID, that has provided us such great flexibility. Well, eight years ago, you were the athletic director at NAU. You have a child as an athletic director. And there's a story I, I heard during an interview gave uh, some years ago about how a new president on campus requested a meeting with you just a few days after giving birth, and he didn't want to do it. But sometimes we have to answer the bell regardless, and you did. So, yeah, it is a juggling act. Um, I, I think it reminds us a lesson I learned from Bill Fagan years ago, Lisa, because he was a full-time student and then the chief operating officer of Aspire. And I asked Bill, how do you juggle that? And he simply said, I have learned how to be really present. So when I'm at work, I'm focused on work. And when I'm at school, I am focused on school. And of course, when I'm home, I'm just focused on my family, on those relationships. It's such a great lesson for anybody, especially those earlier in their careers, because that's how you become great at something, is just put your focus into it. And, and I, I would be remiss if I did not also give my husband so much credit that I have a, a tremendous support um, mm -hmm. in him. You know, we, we've lived in, in locations where family um, hasn't been around, so we've really, it's been the three of us, and, uh, and he's in intercollegiate athletics as well, so it's really a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, we, we always talk about athletics is not a, a, a eight to five, it's a lifestyle, um, but having such a supportive um, spouse, it, it, that's been key as well. Mm -hmm. Well, a message from uh, Jason Siravina, birds up, he is a UTSA yeah. grad himself. Uh, <laughs> Sam West from UTEP says, no question here, El Paso says hello. Uh, Genevieve <laughs> Lopez, Claudia Mar Marin, uh, Danny Garcia, and many others. So uh, yes. I'll give them the picks up. I do have my doctorate from, from UTEP, so mm -hmm. I, I am a, a minor. <laughs> oh, we know. We know, and we're grateful for it. We're grateful for everything today. And uh, leading up to today, you've made a lot of friends. Your uh, connectivity, your your family in the industry has grown today, and we have grown and become better because of you spending time with us. Lisa, thank you so, so much. Oh, I appreciate you all. Thank you for the opportunity. We're better because of it. Thank you so much again. Thank you.